Thank you. Hi. I, I did not drink you under the table, by the way. We were even. <laughs> Equal. My God, but thank you so much, because I would have never came here uh, if he did not actually talk me into it. Or just, and he wrote me this three-page email like two days later after Aspen. And um, yeah, I'm just a sort of a hermit. I like to, I love traveling and I love meeting new people, but I'm, I'm, I'm extremely shy. So you're gonna have to be patient with me on this speech. Also dyslexic, so I go all over the place, but I'm gonna try to rein it in. Uh, <clears throat> thank you again, David. Thank you, Renee. What an opportunity. I, I just can't even believe I'm here. I drove from Cape Cod, the tip of Cape Cod yesterday morning to get to the airport. I got here at 7 a.m. and I, I'm still in shock, but you guys, this whole room inspires me. Um, and the mad team, badass mad team is, is wonderful. All right. <laughs> So, I've gotten so many questions uh, asked to me about my sanity, am I crazy? Um, as I was opening up, uh, actually my first restaurant, which was 15 years ago, uh, I, was I crazy? I needed to raise $2 million while I was living in a housing project with my mother, the last of seven. I owed the IRS $75,000, God knows why. Who the hell would open a butcher shop when she doesn't even know how to butcher? Or put a, a meat retail case in a wine bar in Boston? Who would open what would be the most luxurious fine dining restaurant in the city of Boston during the, during the worst economic downturn in decades? Me. <laughs> I think I'm all right, I don't think crazy. <laughs> I'll always say to myself, is this luck? Luck, luck. Because everyone's like, oh, you're so lucky, you're so lucky. You're so lucky. <laughs> or, or do I have guts? I have balls. balls. Um, but what, what I really think, it, it comes down to a couple of things. Right, right here it says three. I love that word honesty. Honesty, be honest with yourself. Anything that you do, don't lie. You're cheating yourself. Have clarity. Your vision, it's your vision, so when you want to have your vision played out, don't listen to anybody else. Put that tunnel vision on, because it's always worked for me. I don't give a shit what anybody else in this world is doing when I started opening my own restaurants. Uh, I really had that tunnel vision. Um, you gotta have guts, but with humanity and humor. Um, you, you have to be authentic, too. You should be so original, because it, it, it's you. Think about you. Like I said, when David first asked me to be here, he's like, oh, it's all about guts. You got guts. And I'm, you know, a couple of glasses of wine in. I'm like, yeah, all right. I, I, I got guts. All right. I'll give this another thought. My whole mantra in my life has been, I'm not scared. Like, I will talk myself out of everything. In the shittiest times, the stupidest things I've ever done, I'm not scared. And I would go through it, and uh, it worked. But from the time I was a kid, I, I must have been hardwired to um, take any dare that would come my way. I, I would do anything. Um, I stole an MBTA bus when I was 13. Uh, Oh, my mother bought me a Mary Poppins umbrella, and I really thought I could fly when I was seven, so I climbed up a roof and jumped, and that <laughs> didn't work. <laughs> so, uh, f very little people know me here, so for the most of you, um, let me just, sh I'm going to sh just share a little bit about myself, just to s let you know why I am who I am. I was born and raised in a South Boston housing project. <laughs> Woo! Next door to Whitey Bulger, by the way. I don't know if anybody knows Whitey Bulger. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I was the youngest of seven children. My father died a month before I was born. She worked three jobs to keep us off welfare, to feed us. Uh, I never graduated from high school. It was forced busing in Boston. It was awful. It was like a war zone. Um, 
and, um, and I, I really just couldn't learn it. I just couldn't retain information in a classroom. Um, but I did have one, oh, and I was a bookie. I was a bookie in high school. <laughs> I was so good at it. I, I was so good at it. I, I wouldn't even call the numbers in, and I'm putting the cash in my pocket, and then I'm going shopping, and then I'm like, this, this isn't going to last, especially living next to Whitey Bulger. It was not a good idea doing that. Um, <clears throat> And I'm telling you, if a, if a psychic told me 20-something uh, 20, 20 years ago that I would have eight different restaurants in the city of Boston run a $24 million company, I would say, yeah, you can go shove that shit somewhere, right? But I think running numbers was really helpful in the entrepreneurial part. <laughs> but my home ec teacher, she became a mentor. There's no home ec anymore. What happened to home ec? None. Um, but she, you know, I think it was the first time, because my mother was so busy, that she actually showed interest in my passion or the ease of my cooking. We had a, she had a great little um, culinary program in high school. That was the only class I went to. Uh, and then in my mid-20s, I had shit, lots of dead-end jobs, and my best friend talked me out of one of them. And I went on vacation with her. I came back. I didn't have a job. I got a job at a telephone company for two days. Thank you for calling John Hancock Mutual Life Insurance. How may I direct your call? And then Carrie was on the phone, the next person I picked up, and I'm like, I'm going to kill you. I am going to kill you. I, I got to I, I leave. So I moved to Martha's Vineyard, and she came with me. She quit her job. I went to go and interview for a position on a dinner cruise. I think I was 22. Yeah, I was 22. And the owner of the cruise, the dinner cruise, um, was like, well, we don't need a host, and we don't need a server. And I said, no, no, oh, I want to cook. He goes, you want to cook? I was like, yeah, I, I want to cook. He says, well, what kind of experience do you have? Uh, I told this guy everything he wanted to hear. <laughs> I'm making Quahog chowder. You should see the Doval Soul. Like, um, at, at, um, I, worked, I was a server at the St. Patolf Club, and I'm like, Dover Soul, sweet bread's under a bell. I'm from the projects. I haven't even read a cookbook yet, right? So, oh, I'm making a refined Zabayon sauce. He's like, wow, okay. I must have convinced him because I got the job. <clears throat> and then two days before this cruise was going to go out to Falmouth and around, um, the chef quit. And so the owner asked me, well, do you think you can, you can do this job? And I'm like, yes, shit, yes. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> Balls, guts, y you name it. I went to the library on Martha's Vineyard, which isn't really that big and not a really great selection of books, uh, like not a lot of good porn food books at all. It was just like I needed to know how to fillet a tenderloin, how to even cook a tenderloin. I, I never did this before. How to kill a lobster, how to store food in a galley kitchen. Uh, I did it, I did it. Oh my God, it was so successful, I had so much fun. Um, and my friends were all like, where is she? I'm like, I'm cooking on a boat. They're like, no, you're not. I'm like, I am. They're like, who do you think you are, Julia Child? <laughs> like, no, but wouldn't mind being that. So then eventually I left the vineyard. I uh, came back to Boston. And, um, I, I, you know, I worked around town. Oh, I worked for, yeah, some crazy chefs. And then um, throughout that, there was a lot I learned from other restaurants. Restaurants that don't take reservations. It's stressful. You never know how many uh, guests you're gonna be cooking for, et cetera, et cetera. What I did, I put my head down, I worked my ass off, I disciplined myself. I've never had discipline. Discipline is so key in perfecting anything you want. Um, and I learned as much as I could, possibly very fast, all by cookbooks. Um, even the French cookbooks, I had to get a dictionary and translate. So that's how I got inspired, and that's how I learned. Um, five years ago, Montan opened. This is a, it's a Relain Chateau property in Boston. That's fucking unheard of. Um, <laughs> and uh, it, it received four-star review from the Globe. That restaurant critic said, I must have 
canals of steel <laughs> to pull this project off. And that was the best compliment I ever, ever got. I actually had those like fake tattoos made, canals of steel. I got some for you. Um, so I, I, I sort of, I, I, liked being ball, I liked being called Ballsy or Knuckles Lynch or whatever they were calling me. Um, but it's, it's just not about that. I, I mean, we can all be reckless, right? But the challenge is to combine the guts, your feelings, your uh, instinct. Make it personal. Whatever's inside you, you've got to make it personal, authentic, and go for what you want. You have one life. Go for it. So, all right, what role have guts played in my career? What do I want to tell younger chefs? I, I hate this part because I always find this when I hate when young chefs come in and they have a, a notebook. And I go, oh my God, open it up. Let me see your vision. What do you want? Well, I don't have one yet. What designer did you use? Where'd you get your china? Et cetera, et cetera. I don't mind sharing that knowledge at all, because I think that is another key, uh, very key thing to do. Once you have that knowledge, we need to share it. We need to share everything so that we can continue programs like this or symposiums like this and for every one of these young cooks to get out there and cook. But don't fucking come to me with an empty book because I'm not, it's your vision, it's not mine. And once you have that vision, and then I'll, I'll always follow up with them, I'll check in, how you doing, and, you know, the ones with the vision usually make it. Um, I love that word, no. A lot of people say, oh, you can't do it that way. You can't do it that way. But I can't do it any other way. Like, I can't do it however, there, if there's a rule and this is the way you do it, I can't follow that. I don't. Uh, you know, I just don't, I don't know why. This is when we started cracking up um, when we were out. And I kind of always think outside the box. I love it when, they, when you hear these programs about children and your parents are saying, color in the line, color in the line, inside the line, get outside that line. Do whatever you want. It's your creation. Get out of the box. Then, you know, you, you know breaking through barriers, that's tough. When I opened my first restaurant uh, 15 years ago, I had two partners. Well, I gave a third and a third to two guys. One's a general manager, one was my business partner, business manager. And they literally treated me like I was a kid from the projects. I knew nothing. I'm a plumber, basically. Get back in the kitchen, you know nothing about numbers, et cetera. So I took that. And then I, I, I self-taught myself. I read about it. I got it. I understood it. I changed the whole P&L system to the way I could read it. I don't want a yearly P&L, it's too late. I need monthlies, bi-weeklies if it's not working well. And then I got rid of them. <laughs> but, but they were, you know, they were good for when I started because I literally opened a restaurant on, you know, basically self-taught chef. Uh, so I, I did spend uh, like two hard years cooking in that kitchen and I couldn't worry about management. I hate managing. Um, so was I, was I reckless? Was I gutsy? Yeah, but you, you're gonna go through those things. This is life, you're gonna evolve and you better get some balls if you don't have them. You have to get, you have to trust your instincts. It's, it's you. Um, I'm, I might've grown up poor and I might've grown up not educated, but I knew what my restaurant should be like. I knew, I knew what I could cook. I knew what I could handle. I couldn't go over that. That would be too overwhelming. So there's, don't, don't take on more than what you don't think you can handle, because life's gonna come down with a lot more. Make sure you know what you do. You know, don't open a 250 seat restaurant and think that you're gonna make mega bucks. You're gonna have the same headache if you do that and you open up a 10 seat joint. Um, uh, uh, it says here, don't open up shit you can't handle, so we skipped that part. Um, be honest with yourself, that's a key one. Take inventory of your strengths and your weaknesses. I never did this. I was so insecure, I was so afraid to ask for help. Um, that changed, I think. Uh, when I went, and I, it was on my fifth restaurant, and, uh, and I knew I couldn't do it all. I was like suicidal. 
uh, and my weaknesses are management, and I'm, I'm, I don't like a micromanagement. I'm, I'm a group person. I love building teams. I love having my, uh, my it's called Barbara Lynch Grupo. You know, I, don't ha I ha barely have turnover. Sometimes we gotta get them out because it, it, it's costly and we all know that. But, you know, I've had my same, my wine director and I have been together for 25 years. We started when we were puppies. Um, so they don't really leave and that's a really important part because turnover in your kitchen or in your front of the house is gonna cost you a shitload of money. There's a lot of training, a lot of wasted time. Um, so if you're not strong, at trying to build a culture and trying to, you know, work with management, you should rethink that one. Um, uh, having nothing to lose could be a good thing. Uh, it worked for me. I had nothing. <laughs> I had an Isuzu Trooper, and I would like, like, drive it and pretend that I was like in a Range Rover. It was awesome. Like, do you like it? <laughs> I'm the one. I was living with my mother. I owed the IRS money, and here I am trying to raise money on Christmas Eve in Boston for my first restaurant. But I, what did I have to lose, right? Nothing. I got two million. I got one phone call, 500,000 Christmas Eve. And he said, all my other friends, well, they're Jewish, but they're away for the holidays, so maybe when they get back, they'll call you. And I'm like, okay, great. I knew nothing. I had no financials. I had no background. I had a vision. A white tablecloth restaurant, 70 seats. I was very uh, low on the check average so that I knew I could climb up. And I trusted and I listened to my investors. You know, I didn't have the menus written too small. I listened to their advice. I went to lunch maybe once a month. And these are investors who helped build Boston, they're old Brahmin Bostonians. And I'm like, wow, how'd I get here? This is just crazy. But I wanted to succeed because you know what? Somebody believed in me. They had given me money. I was a bookie. Crackers. Um, but it made me want to work harder. It made me want to figure it out. It made me want them to be proud of who they invested in. Eight restaurants later, they make a lot of money off me. It, but I love it. Um, money and ego are the two things you don't want to think that that's what's gonna run your restaurant. You don't. Passion, passion, passion. You can only fake shit for so long. Passion. Uh, okay, here we go, sorry. I told you I get lost. TED Talk was awful. I had to do a TED Talk, it was awful. Um, <clears throat> know the value of patience, timing, and intuition. Intuition is key. Um, I've always trusted my intuition. I think women have a stronger intuition, so they have to really trust it. Uh, patience and timing, I've gotten everything right. One con oh, I had one concept that failed. I had a little store called Plum Produce. It was the cutest little thing. 250 square feet right next to the, my butcher shop, and then I have a cooking demonstration bookstore called Stir. And I'm like, well, I should be my own neighbor. I really don't need anything, but all right. I'll put a produce shop there. It was like the prettiest produce shop ever. I think people were afraid to come in. But I wanted to show the public that we can have great porcini mushrooms or truffles and the squash, the window display. My staff was really mad because they'd come in and I'm just spritzing the lettuces and they're like, chef, I think you have more things to do than this. I'm like, no, but I really like it here. <laughs> it's really nice. Um, you know, I didn't do my homework though. Uh, where I am in the South End, young, urban, they cook on the weekends. Uh, so I really wasn't moving the produce. And um, every night I would dehydrate. And I was dehydrating everything. Like then I was making powders and salts and, blah, blah, blah. and then the health department came in and he's like, Miss Lynch, you're just, you're crazy. You can't dehydrate. I had 10 those uh, the quip dehydrators on the floor. He's like, you need a commissary. You're gonna be like the Heinz ketchup lady. And I'm like, I hope not. But um, so there is, I was making money on all the dehydrated stuff. It was access. It was food. They, no one had to peel or chop or throw away. Kids would come in. They're eating bananas and pineapples, raspberries, blackberries. 
So I listened to the health department. I didn't want a commissary because I had just signed on to 15,000 square feet of space to build three other restaurants. So I had to put that one on the back burner. But I knew I was onto something, and the timing, thank God, the timing wasn't right five, six years ago. So I'm starting that company like in a month. It's, uh, it's dehydration, it's instant food, it'll be in vending machines, it'll be in airports, it'll be in hospitals. It gives you a healthy choice, right? So now I'm, I'm focused on that. But anyway, I don't want to bore you anymore. So, canals of steel. Oh my God, is Ducasse here? Because I just sat in a seat for a minute. I always, always, I wanted to be Elaine Ducasse or Joelle Rubichon. I'm telling you, that was, that was, like, that was my carrot. I finally come to the point, I'm so happy to be Barbara Lynch. Aww. Thank you. Thank you.